Hi, I'm Mike Wallace and we're going to be servicing my TNT. Okay, let's get down there. This DVD covers a typical major service for the TNT, starting with an oil change. Remove the sump plug to drain the oil. It's also a good idea to check the magnetic pickup for excessive amounts of metal particles. To remove the oil filter, you must first remove the safety strap. Then use a filter wrench to remove the filter. Use the key to remove the rider and pillion seats. To remove the tank, you must first remove the ignition key shroud. Now remove the two rear tank mounting bolts. Followed by the two front mounting bolts. Have someone lift the tank whilst you remove the two overflow drain tubes, the wiring harness and the main fuel line. Okay, Undo all the bolts, including the centre one, to remove the air box lid. Lift the lid away to gain access to the air cleaner element. Remove the supporting screen and then the filter element. Check the air box drain hole and clean if required. It's also a good idea to clean the inside of the air box, but be careful not to drop any debris into the throttle bodies. To remove the airbox assembly, first remove the flat valve and disconnect its cable from the solenoid. Now remove the airbox's two front mounting bolts. Then undo the three clamps holding the airbox to the throttle bodies. Finally, remove the breather hose before lifting the airbox away. Here you can see the three clamps that hold the airbox to the throttle bodies. Now remove the lower airbox ducting. To drain the engine coolant, first remove the access cover to the radiator filler cap. <laughs> Then remove the drain plug located on the water pump. Undo the filler cap to allow the coolant to drain. Quick. 
To remove the left hand radiator, first remove the indicator retaining bolt located behind the shroud. Now remove the mounting bolt behind the indicator, taking care not to lose the top hat spacer. Then unclip the rear of the shroud, disconnect the indicator and remove. Repeat this procedure for the right hand side. Now disconnect the left hand fan. and remove the lower hose. Followed by the hose clamp on the upper hose. Next undo the two upper mounting bracket bolts. Followed by the two lower radiator mounting bolts. Remove the remaining mounting bolt and lift the radiator away. Finally remove the radiator duct. Now remove the right hand radiator in a similar manner. You can leave the upper hose connected. You will find an extra hose located behind the radiator. Remove the three clamp bolts to gain access to the stick coils. Disconnect and remove the three stick coils. It's a good idea to clean the rocker cover and the plug recesses to remove any dirt that may fall into the cylinder. Undo the three plugs. You will find it easier to lift the plugs out using a magnet. Remember to check the condition of the plugs after they have been removed. Remove the breather from the rocker cover. Now remove the throttle cables for easier removal of the rocker cover. Next remove the bolts holding the rocker cover in place. Lift the cover out from the right hand side. Remove the inspection cover to give access to the end of the crankshaft. Now turn the engine over to line up the timing marks. You may also wish to check the cam timing at this point too. You'll find it easier if you keep a record of your valve clearance measurements for future reference. Check the clearances on the first diagonal pair of inlet and exhaust valves. The inlet valve should be between 0.3 to 0.35 mm and the exhaust between 0.35 to 0.4 mm. Now rotate the engine over to bring another set of valves to fully closed. The feeler gauge should be a firm fit for an accurate measurement. Finally, rotate the engine over to bring the last set of valves into position. Before refitting the rocker cover, Remove any remaining sealant from the rocker cover gasket surfaces and wipe clean. Applying a thin smear of a good gasket sealant such as 3Bond will reduce the chance of oil leaks. Now refit the rocker cover and bolt into place.
Then screw in the inspection cover. Carefully insert three new NGK CR9E or equivalent spark plugs gapped to between 0.7 and 0.8 millimeter. Clean the three stick coils before inserting. You may wish to apply a silicon spray to ease insertion. Replace the clamps that hold the stick coils in place. Finally, replace the breather hose. Refit the right hand radiator starting with the hose on the rear. Then refit the duct before sliding the radiator into position. Now reconnect the lower hose. You should replace any hose connectors that have been damaged on removal. Then refit the upper bracket followed by the lower mounting bolts. Finish off by reconnecting the fan and cable tying the fan wiring to the bracket. Now repeat this procedure for the left hand side. Refit the coolant drain plug. Now slowly refill the coolant system with approximately 3 litres of coolant. Allow it to sit before checking and top up if required. Refit the filler cap. Now refit the throttle cables. Then place the lower airbox duct into position. Now refit the airbox. Tighten the three throttle body clamps. Refit the breather hose. Bolt in the flat valve assembly. and attach the cable to the solenoid. Before we can refit the air cleaner element it must be cleaned. If it is heavily soiled it must be first cleaned in a suitable solvent. You should check the filter for damage and replace if necessary. Then wash the filter with a good detergent and allow to dry. Now spray the inlet side of the filter with a good filter oil and work it into the foam. Refit the lower filter screen and then the filter element followed by the top screen. Refit the airbox lid starting with the central bolt. Refit the two front airbox mounting bolts. To adjust the clutch we must remove the right hand engine cover. You should also back off or remove the clutch cable from the actuator arm. Carefully release the lock nut using an impact gun if necessary. Using a hex key, screw the adjuster all the way in and then back out half a turn. Now tighten the lock nut before cleaning the gasket surface. You may want to apply a small amount of sealant to the front and rear horizontal crankcase split to reduce the chance of leaks.
carefully fit the cover using a couple of bolts to hold the gasket in place. Before fitting the oil filter, clean off any oil with solvent and rags. Oil the filter o-ring before spinning it on and tightening until firm. Use a filter wrench to tighten about another quarter turn. Refit the filter retaining strap. Refit the sump plug using a new crush washer. Refill the engine with about 3.8 litres of SAE 15 weight 50 oil to start with. We will check the level later after starting the engine and top up if necessary. Refit the filler plug. Elevate the rear wheel to allow it to rotate. Using a good quality lubricant, spray both the inside and outside of the chain. You should also check the chain for tight spots and the condition of the front and rear sprockets. To adjust the chain, loosen the four pinch bolts to each side. There should be between 30 to 40 millimeters play in the chain. If not, you will need to adjust it. Use two large hex keys to rotate the adjusters. Only small amounts of movement are required, so take it slowly. When complete, tighten the four pinch bolts. The fuel filter is located inside the fuel tank. First remove the bolts holding the fuel pump assembly in place, noting the position of the unit for reassembly. Next lift the assembly clear. Remove the filter securing screw and then the two hose clamps. Now remove the old filter and replace, making sure you fit the new filter in the correct direction of flow. Tighten the two hose clamps and replace the filter securing screw. Refit the pump assembly to the fuel tank in the same position as before and bolt into place. Have someone hold the tank in place whilst you reconnect the wiring harness and the main fuel line. And don't forget to reconnect the two overflow drain tubes. Replace the two front mounting bolts, followed by the two rear bolts. Finally, Refit the ignition shroud. To adjust the steering head, we must first elevate the front wheel. Now loosen the two top triple clamp pinch bolts. Remove the two bolts holding the handlebars in place and rest the bars on a soft pad. Loosen the top steering nut. Whilst this is a Torx head, an Imperial hex key fits perfectly. Tap both sides of the upper triple clamp to give some clearance. Now check the front end for any play or looseness in the steering head bearing or any tightness or roughness when turned. You can adjust the bearings after loosening the locking ring. A special tool is required, but it is possible to use a C-spanner. The factory torque specification is 16 Newton meters. When finished, tap down the top triple clamp, tighten the top nut and pinch bolts, and refit the handlebars. To bleed the front brakes, it is best to rotate the master cylinder to an upright position. Before removing the cap, wipe away any dirt and moisture. 
Remove the cap and then the bellows. Clean the bellows of any trace of moisture, dirt and old fluid. Top up the master cylinder if required. Fit a ring spanner to the bleed nipple followed by a bleed hose and bottle. Pump the lever and hold. Now release the bleed nipple until the lever has pulled into the bars. Close the bleed nipple before releasing the lever. Repeat the procedure. Check and top up the master cylinder as required with dot four fluid during the process. If you are flushing the brake lines, you can pump the lever continuously once the bleed hose is filled with fluid. Repeat this procedure for the other side and top up the master cylinder when done. Replace the bellows before refitting the cap. Finish off by refitting the nipple covers. The easiest way to replace the brake pads is to remove the caliper. First pull the two pins and lift out the two spring clips noting which way they sit. The pads can now be removed. If you are going to reuse the pads make a note of their position. The minimum wear thickness for these pads is 0.5 millimeters. If you need to seat the pistons to fit new pads, clean the calipers with a brake cleaner to remove all dust and grime first. Now push the pistons home. You may need to remove some fluid from the master cylinder so it's worth checking the fluid first. Refit the pads by dropping them into position, refitting the spring clips in the correct position and inserting the retaining pins. Now refit the caliper to the front forks. When finished, remember to pump up the brakes and check the fluid level in the master cylinder. The procedure for the rear brake is very similar, but you may have to remove the rear caliper to bleed it properly because the bleed nipple is located underneath. To refit the left hand shroud, First, clip it into place. Next, fit the mounting bolt located behind the indicator, remembering to replace the top hat spacer that fits between the shroud and the mount. Then refit the indicator retaining bolt located on the back of the shroud assembly. Now reconnect the indicator and cable tie the cable. Repeat this procedure for the right hand side. Refit the pillion and rider seats. Start the engine and run until warm. Check all lights and the horn for correct functioning. Check the oil level and top up if required. And make sure the coolant level is between the minimum and maximum marks. It's well worth doing a general check over and tighten of all major external fasteners. Lubricate all controls, foot pegs and the side stand. Lastly, check the tyre pressures. The factory recommended pressures are 36 psi for both the front and rear wheels. It's now time to take the bike for a test ride. Before we start on the setup, it would be a good idea to run through how the system operates. The fuel injection system on the TNT uses a Walbro ECU. This ECU performs its job using a variety of sensors and servos. These can be divided into five distinct groups. First is the ignition circuit, which consists of the three stick coils and plugs. Next is the fuel circuit, which consists of the fuel pump, pressure regulator and the three injectors. Thirdly, we have the environment and engine sensors. 
These consist of the engine temperature sensor, which is located on the rear of the right hand cylinder, the air temperature sensor, which is located above the headlight assembly, the barometric pressure or altitude sensor, which is integrated into the Walbro ECU, a phase sensor, which measures engine RPM and crank position and is located on the right hand end of the crankshaft, a throttle position sensor or TPS, which is located on the right hand end of the throttle body linkage and as the name suggests measures throttle position. And finally on later models fitted with a catalytic converter a lambda sensor which measures the exhaust oxygen level and is fitted ahead of the cat. The fourth group consists of the three engine surveys. These consist of the stepper motor assembly which regulates the air bypass and is used as part of the cold start adjustment system this is located on the right hand side under the air box. The second servo is the solenoid that shuts the flaps in the air box and the exhaust butterfly valve at low RPM. This is located on the rear of the left hand cylinder. Thirdly we have the cooling fans located on each radiator. The final group consists of the clutch, neutral and side stand micro switches and the tip over cutout which is located behind the throttle bodies under the tank. The Walbro ECU uses a series of tables contained in a map file and the above sensors and servos to regulate the fuel and spark timing for any given engine RPM and throttle position. For example, the main fuel map is a table of values plotted for throttle position versus RPM. The plotted values regulating the fuel being supplied to the engine each cycle by varying the duration of the fuel injector pulses. The spark map works in a similar manner giving ignition advance settings for a range of throttle positions versus RPM. Finally we have a range of other tables that include adjustments for air and engine temperature, altitude and other functions such as when to turn on the fans or open the exhaust valve. Later models fitted with the lambda sensor are also able to learn by measuring the exhaust gas oxygen level and modify their behaviour. The Walbro ECU is capable of storing two independent maps and the TNT is fitted with a power button on the dash which allows the rider to select between them. From the factory, button out is full power whilst button in offers a more economical and tractable power delivery. Whilst the factory advise against it, maps can be swapped on the fly. What follows is a brief description on setting up the fuel injection system. Please consult the service manual or a qualified service technician for a complete rundown on this procedure. It's best to have the bike warmed up properly before you begin. The easiest way is to take the bike for a short ride. Before we can proceed any further, we must first remove the seat, tank and air box to gain access to the throttle bodies. We've covered the removal of these items earlier, so we'll assume you know how it's done. After removing the seat, lift the fuel tank Disconnect the two overflow drain tubes, swing it around and place it on some padding at the rear of the bike. You will need an assistant to hold the tank or a strap to hold it securely during the balance process. If you have access to an Axone or a Tune Boy, you should first delete errors and reset the throttle position sensor or TPS before any adjustment to the throttle bodies is made. This is done by first winding back the idle speed adjuster to allow the throttles to close fully. Then flick the throttle a few times to make sure it's fully closed, select the appropriate menu and reset the TPS for fully closed. Next hold the throttle wide open, select the appropriate menu and calibrate the TPS for fully open. The Axone reading when the cable is backed off should be between 35 and 45 and at full throttle the reading should be 212 plus or minus 2. If the closed reading is outside these parameters, the TPS may be faulty. If the TPS is faulty or not set correctly, no amount of tuning will enable the bike to run correctly. Before starting the engine, reset the idle on the Axone to 1, which corresponds to 1% of throttle opening and shouldn't be confused with the TPS setting or reading. This will avoid any coughing and stalling issues. Now start the engine and adjust the idle speed back to between 1400 and 1500 RPM. Now remove the three hoses that run from the throttle bodies to the stepper motor and connect your vacuum gauges into each line using a T-piece. 
Unless they have been tampered with, you shouldn't need to touch the main throttle body balance and adjust the butterflies. They are set at the factory for balance at full throttle opening and not at idle. In most cases, a visual check should suffice. Now start the engine and make sure it is at operating temperature and idle is between 14 and 1500 RPM. Then find the cylinder with the lowest vacuum and screw that bypass screw all the way in. Then match the other two cylinders with it using the remaining two bypass screws. It will be pretty obvious if you don't have the right screw because you won't be able to match the other two. Finish off by removing your vacuum gauges and reconnecting the hoses to the stepper motor. To check the operation of the stepper motor, place your finger gently in the opening just touching the piston and turn on the ignition. You should feel the valve move slightly upward in a series of steps. If not, the stepper motor may be faulty. To avoid damaging the stepper motor, never push too hard on the piston. You can also check the electrical functioning of the stepper with the axone. The symptoms of a faulty stepper motor are excessive black smoke once the bike is warmed up, which will lead to fouled plugs. At this point, you should again calibrate the throttle position sensor, or TPS, and reset the idle speed. Finally, if your TNT is a pre-CAT model and you have access to a gas analyzer, you can insert a probe into the exhaust to measure the CO level. It is also possible to set the CO level by ear. Now start and warm up the engine to operating temperature, making sure that you have allowed the gas analyzer sufficient time to warm up. Usually this is around 10 minutes. Using the appropriate menu on your Axone or Tuneboy, adjust the idle CO level to the desired amount. The factory CO setting is between 1 and 1.5 to meet emission requirements. However, this setting can cause poor idling. Setting the CO level to between 3.5 and 5.5 can improve things immensely, but is of course illegal for the street in some countries. On the Axone, the higher the CO number, the richer the mixture will be. But remember that this number is only a reference point that will vary from bike to bike and is not to be confused with the actual CO reading. For example, one bike may be perfectly tuned with a CO number of 112, whilst another will require a CO number of 135. When you are finished, recheck the idle speed and adjust if necessary. Because the two maps accessed via the power button are totally independent, the idle CO setting will need to be set for each map. Fortunately, once found, 99% of the time the Axone CO number is the same for both maps. For racing purposes only, there is also an adjustment in the Axone to increase or decrease the fuel delivery across the entire map. For example, you could increase the delivery by 10% if required and in both maps. The important thing here to remember is that you would then need to go back and reset your idle COs again. That's it, you are all done.
Thank you.